The day of Christ, I believe the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, are one and the same. Now, you have to come to your own conclusions. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You know, let's read verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Isn't that amazing? We've mentioned a couple of my favorite epistles, First and Second Thessalonians, the first epistles Paul wrote, he only spent at the most three weeks, three and a half weeks, with the Thessalonians. He taught them everything. These were pagans. They turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God to wait for his son from heaven. He taught them about the rapture and so forth. And as we mentioned, we have Christians who have been at least professing Christians for years, and they hardly understand anything. And read uh, what Paul says to these people. But anyway, he says, you, I don't even need to tell you about the times and seasons, brethren. You know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now, I don't think you could put that thief in the night, and we come back to that again, because I'm a believer in a pre-tribulation rapture. I don't think you can get anything else from the Bible. But how would you have the day of the Lord beginning as a thief in the night, supposing it began at the end of the great tribulation? Uh, it's not going to be a thief in the night. It's not going to surprise anybody. Uh, I mean, you've seen all of these events exactly as the Bible foretold them. Jerusalem is surrounded by the armies. The world about to go down in flames. The Antichrist has been in control. He's put his image in the, in the temple and so forth. I mean, that's hardly a thief of the night. Uh, at the end of, uh, of, of the millennial reign of Christ, that's hardly a thief of the night. Satan is loosed and so forth. So I think the only time you could have uh, the day of the Lord beginning as a thief in the night would be before the Great Tribulation. The rapture, come, which comes as a thief in the night, marks the beginning of the day of the Lord. Uh, so anyway, to 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. So if you believe in a pre-trib rapture, would you be upset to know that the day of the Lord was at hand? Praise God, we're about to leave. Uh, if you believe in a mid-trib rapture, would you be upset? No, we got to, you know, if you believed in a post-trib rapture, would you be upset? No, I mean, we got to go through this thing. Let's get on with it, you know. Uh, nobody would be upset. Uh, my marginal note, and by the way, there was no such marginal note in the 1611 uh, King James, it says, now present. And if you want to read at hand, check up, look it up in your uh, concordance or whatever, at hand, that expression all through the King James Bible from Genesis to Revelation means it's about to come. It's at hand. It hasn't yet come. Nobody would be upset if that were the case. But what if it is now present? If the day of the Lord had already come, then who would be upset? Well, only those who had been taught of a pre-trib rapture. <laughs> If Paul had taught you of a pre-trib rapture and that the rapture occurred and then the day of the Lord began, and now you get a letter from Paul saying the day of the Lord has already come, then either you've been left behind or Paul made a mistake and he's not an apostle. So it's a very powerful scripture for a pre-trib rapture. Nobody would be upset if you're mid-trib, post-trib, amillennial, whatever, and the day of the Lord is, is, has already come, why, why would you be upset? Well, we got to get on with, on with this thing. Okay, so now, what about this thing called the rapture? Uh, that, that word isn't even in the Bible. Well, neither is Trinity in the Bible. Uh, but rapture is in the Bible. If you could read Latin, which I can't, uh, you go back to... Uh, First Thessalonians chapter 4, and you would find, uh, you know, beginning at verse 13 in that passage, you will find rapere is the infinitive, raptus is the word that is used, and it's a Latin expression that means an ecstatic catching away. Doesn't it say, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's repere. 
raptus, we shall be raptured, <laughs> caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's what it says. Sounds to me like a rapture. It sounds to me like we're being taken off of this earth. Um, in um, John 14, and we just have to kind of talk fast, and, and, and sometimes we just have to quote the scriptures rather than turning to them. But you know the scripture in John 14. That Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Buddha never said he would come again. Mohammed never said he would come again. It would have been nonsense because they're dead. But Jesus, although he said he would die, he would come again because he said he would rise from the dead the third day. So Jesus says, if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Sounds to me like he's going to catch us up and take us away from this earth, doesn't it? So <clears throat> I don't see how people can deny the rapture and say that it's not biblical teaching. I was on the radio and um, uh, a Catholic called in, and I don't remember what I said that upset this Catholic, but the Catholic called in and said, I want you to know that we Roman Catholics do not believe what you evangelicals believe. Well, I said, thank you very much. Because when I try to tell my evangelical friends that, a lot of them won't believe me. <laughs> maybe, maybe they'll take it from you. Uh, and then this, this Catholic said, and we don't believe in the rapture. Well, I think I, I, think I mentioned that earlier this week, didn't I? A couple of days ago. Uh, well, I said, of course you don't believe in the rapture. I mean, how could you believe in the rapture? You believe in purgatory. People have to spend different lengths of time in purgatory. Uh, some people, you know, uh, if you die wearing the brown scapular uh, of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, which on one end of it says, whosoever dies wearing the scapular shall not suffer eternal fire. And Mary, this, this is the fake Mary, the phony Mary, but Mary promised that those who die wearing her scapula the Saturday after their death, she will go into purgatory and personally take them to heaven. Uh, well, then you get out pretty fast. But otherwise, you may not get out so fast. And you have to have mass after mass after mass. A mass card says, you open it up and it says, with the sympathy of, you fill in your name. A mass will be said for the repose of the soul of, you fill in the name of the deceased. And you give that with an offering to the priest, and he will put that on the altar when he says Mass. And that will supposedly reduce the time of suffering for that poor soul some unspecified amount. Nobody knows. So therefore you have to say Mass after Mass after Mass. A friend of mine, his father died, and he said they bought more than $2,000 worth of Mass cards at the funeral. Because you never know, and one of the ways that they uh, will entice you to buy more Mass cards is the one you buy may be the one that will open the gate to heaven. So I said to this Catholic, you believe in purgatory? People are in there for different lengths of time. How could you possibly have a simultaneous resurrection of all the dead? Some of them haven't done their time in purgatory. And then it says, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. How could you have a catching up of the living who haven't even been to purgatory? When your church clearly teaches that it was not enough for Christ to suffer on the cross, you must suffer for your own sins as well. Uh, and basically, mainly, I mean, I've never met a Catholic who didn't expect to go to purgatory. If you go to hell, you're finished. But if you go to purgatory, which is not a biblical teaching, well, at least you have hopes of finally getting out if you suffer long enough. So they couldn't believe in the rapture. So the Catholic Church uh, de denies uh, the rapture. But the Bible, the Bible teaches it. Now, what about the difference then between the rapture and the second coming? We suggested that there's a difference. Well, at the rapture, as the verses that we've quoted uh, tell us clearly, Christ comes for his own. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Well, in fact, it says, those who sleep in Jesus 
shall God bring with him, that is, the souls and the spirits of those who died with faith in Christ. They were absent from the body, the scripture says, present with the Lord. Their soul and their spirit has been with Christ in heaven. Their body has been dead in the grave. And when he comes, he brings the souls and spirits of those who died with faith in Christ. He brings them down with him and he resurrects their body and it, it, the body is reunited with the soul and spirit and the living, that is, those who have faith in Christ, we are transformed. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I show you a mystery, Paul says. And the mystery is not some secret, but it's something that has not been understood in the past that is now being revealed. This is the, the meaning of the word. I, behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep. In other words, we won't all die. But we will all be changed. You have to be changed. You can't get through the roof uh, without being changed. I remember when I was a boy, I used to sit close to my mother, and the minute I saw her go, I was going to grab a hold. Uh, well, I wouldn't have got through the roof without a, without a new body. So Paul says, we must all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Okay, so the rapture, Christ comes, he takes his own to heaven. Those who have died and those who are alive, he catches them up, transforms them, um, and takes them to heaven. The second coming, he comes with his saints. Uh, uh, Zechariah 14 uh, tells you that. It says, when his feet touch the Mount of Olives, he brings all the saints from heaven with him. But you don't have to be a genius to realize if he brings them from heaven with him, he must have taken them up there. They didn't get up there on their own. Uh, so they were raptured. There's a seven-year period. I believe the scripture clearly tells us that's the 70th week uh, of Daniel, and we don't have time to go into that. But you know in, Re in Revelation 19, there's a wedding up there. There, there's the judgment seat of Christ. The bride um, is clothed in fine linen, white and clean. We have had our lives reviewed. We have given an account for everything we've said or done or thought and so forth. We've received reward. There have been some losses of reward. Our works have been tried by fire. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. That's not, I'm not being burned in fire. That's not purgatory. It very clearly says, and furthermore, burning you in fire wouldn't redeem you. We have redemption in his blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So you can't pay for your sins by suffering here or in purgatory or anywhere else. In fact, it takes a sinless victim, perfect sacrifice, to pay the penalty for sins. And if Christ had any sins of his own, he couldn't have died for our sins. He would have to die, uh, die for his own. So there's a wedding in heaven. We're clothed in fine linen, white and clean, the righteousness of saints, because his righteousness has been imputed to us. And then we return as the armies of heaven in the midst of Armageddon. So the second coming is for a couple of reasons, uh, to rescue Israel in the midst of Armageddon. Jesus, in Matthew 24, verse 22, he says there's going to be a great tribulation, such as never was or ever shall be. And then he says, except those days be shortened, no flesh would survive. Now that's a, that's a powerful prophecy that you couldn't have understood 100 years ago, much less 1900 years ago. Our generation is the first one that has the weapons that can wipe out all flesh on planet Earth. I mean, we could do it about 10 times over with the weapons that we have, and there wouldn't even be a cockroach, not even a microbe. There would be nothing left alive on this planet. It'd be like a sterile bit of dust drifting through space. And Jesus says, in those days, unless I cut those days short, unless I intervene and rescue Israel, there won't be any flesh left. Uh, it's um, a powerful proof of the validity of the word of God because you couldn't have even imagined such a thing uh, when that prophecy, when Jesus gave that prophecy. You don't wipe out all flesh with bows and arrows and swords 
and spears and not even with you know, uh, conventional weapons of, of World War II. So the scripture, I think, uh, is, is fairly clear that there are these two events, the rapture and the second coming. Well, we'll go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and just see what it says here. Verse 5, remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. See, Paul says, I already taught you. Amazing. These pagans, idol worshipers. He only spent three weeks with them. He's taught them everything. Now he's putting it down in writing. He taught it to them orally. Now he's putting it in writing. And, and verse 6, and now you know what withholdeth or what prevents him that he might be revealed in his time. There's a time when the Antichrist can be revealed, and I hope we can find time to come back and talk about that. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth or hinders will hinder until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked, that's the Antichrist, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So a major purpose of the second coming, not only to rescue Israel and to stop the destruction on planet Earth or there be no flesh left, but also to destroy Antichrist and his kingdom. Now that brings us to an important consideration. Now there are people who deny the rapture. I mean, in fact, it's becoming less and less popular. I remember in 19, late 1968, was it, or thereabouts, I can't remember exactly, and we had a large home, as I think I mentioned, in those days. Uh, and um, uh, we uh, had more meetings in our home than most churches have, believe it or not. We saw numbers of young people especially come to Christ every week. And uh, we had Jewish meetings, for example. I can remember, when, uh, I think, probably 120 Jewish people in our living room when Hal Lindsey stood up and held up the late great planet Earth. Well, it was a mock-up. There were nothing on the pages. They were blank pages, but he had the cover. And he was very pleased and very proud. His first book. Uh, and uh, I remember in those days, people, well, you had bumper stickers. I don't know if you had them here, but we had them in America. Ride at your own risk. I'm leaving in the rapture. Uh, so many people were expecting the rapture. They were all talking about it. And in those days, people used to ask me, do you think the Lord is coming right now? And I'd say, well, I expect him. I believe in imminency. I'm longing and hoping for his, but, but you know, I think too many people are expecting him. Because Matthew 24, is it verse 44, somewhere around there? Jesus says, at such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And in those days, they had the idea that um, in, in Matthew 24, Jesus said, um, this generation shall not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. Now, there are, there's a little bit of controversy about that. The people that we call preterists, uh, by the way, R.C. Sproul, who may, might be a name that would be familiar to you, or D. James Kennedy, uh, these are preterists. And by that, we, what they mean is that the whole Olivet Discourse and the whole book of Revelation up to chapter, the middle of chapter 20 has already been fulfilled. Nero was the Antichrist. It was all fulfilled in AD 70. And Christ returned, can you imagine? Christ returned in the presence of the Roman armies to destroy Israel, to wipe out his people, to excommunicate them, and now the church is Israel. That's not biblical. And I, I well, look, um, can we hold our finger here? Now let's go to Matthew 24. We better look at this. Matthew 24, verse 33. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Well, the preterist says he meant literally that generation that was on the earth. And sure enough, by AD 70, within a period of 40 years, uh, uh, there we go. Uh, it was all fulfilled. No, it wasn't. I mean, look, go back to verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. Uh, Matthew 24, 21. Well, you could say certainly what happened then was the greatest tribulation the Jews had ever had. But then, what does it say? No, nor ever shall be. Has there been greater tribulation? Of course there has. Hitler killed six million. Uh, uh, 
Josephus tells us 1.2 million died at this time. What about all the Christians? I don't think Jesus is talking uh, just to Israel. I believe that much of what he says is for the church as well. Uh, what about Hitler and, and Stalin and Mao? I mean, there's been far greater tribulation, both for Jews and for Christians, since then. So it wasn't fulfilled within that generation. Uh, go over to verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, oh, here's a post-trib rapture. Shall the sun be darkened, moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That didn't happen in AD 70. It didn't happen within a literal generation. Uh, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. By the way, this is not the rapture. At the rapture, we read it. The Lord himself descends from heaven, and he catches us up to meet him. Here the angels gather his elect. Who are his elect? Israel is. Israel, mine elect. The Old Testament uses that term many times. So this is a, at the second coming. This is the gathering of Israel, all the Jews, to Israel, where the Messiah who returns to rescue them will reign over them. Well, then there are those who, and that's what brought me to this, there are those who said, and you know, many people thought this was what Hal Lindsey was saying, although he denies that he was literally saying that. But they said, no, it's the generation that sees Israel back in her land. Well, then now they've fudged a little bit, and some of them are saying, no, it's the generation that saw Israel take Jerusalem in 67. And now that gives us another 40 years, you know, so 2007. Um, and so they said, well, 40 years is a generation. 1948, Israel became a nation. 1988, it's going to be wound up, subtract seven years Great Tribulation, and the rapture will occur in 1981. It didn't. Disillusioned a lot of people. And I saw the pendulum swing from pre-trib to mid-trib to post-trib, and finally they began to deny the rapture. Is that serious? Does it really matter? I mean, well, look, if the real Christ, and this is the seriousness of what's being taught today, part of it at least, if the real Christ is going to catch us up and we're going to meet him in the air and you've been taught that you are serving a Christ who when you meet him your feet are planted on planet earth and he hasn't come to take you to heaven, he's come to rule over the kingdom you've established for him, then you've been serving antichrist. It's that simple. You're, you've been serving the very kingdom that Christ comes in his second coming to destroy. Uh, so it is rather a serious, well, why, would, why should we even talk about the rapture? If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Wait a minute, it's, it's Bible. It's taught in the Word of God. We're to know the Word of God. And furthermore, there are some problems uh, if, if you don't believe in it. So then what is this generation? <laughs> this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Well, we don't have time to go to the Scriptures, but Jesus talked about a disobedient generation a gainsaying generation, a rebellious generation, a faithless generation, a perverse generation, a sign-seeking generation. And I believe what Jesus is saying is, oh, there will be many Jews who will come to Christ. Praise God. The gospel is to the Jew first. And the first church, uh, first, uh, church was, was all Jewish. But Israel as a whole will remain in unbelief and in rejection of their Messiah and of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob until all is fulfilled. When all is fulfilled, Jesus said, you will know I'm right at the door when you see all these signs fulfilled. There are no signs for the rapture. The signs are for the second coming. And, and uh, when it is all fulfilled, Zechariah 12.10, the prophet Zechariah says, they will look on me, Yahweh is speaking, they will look on me whom they have pierced. And you go back and read that chapter if you're not familiar with it, and all Israel is saved. Uh, all Jews that are alive on planet Earth, they recognize at last, this is their Messiah that they have rejected, and they turn to him. He pours out the spirit of supplication and grace uh, upon them, and all Israel is saved. So I believe that that's what, he, what he's saying. This generation, this unbelieving, rebellious, uh, gainsaying uh, generation, faithless generation, 
will remain until all uh, is fulfilled. Well, I used to say in those days when they asked me, uh, when do you think the Lord is coming? I used to say, too many people are expecting him. Because he said, well, we're there. Go to verse 44. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now that tells us something. Compare that with verse 33. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. So Jesus says on the one hand, he says, any idiot knows when I'm coming. You've seen all the signs. All the signs have been manifest. You know that I'm right there. But then he says, no, I'm going to come at a time when you wouldn't think that I'm coming. Now, how can you put those two together? You see, people say, well, wait a minute. You're saying that there's two events yet, two comings of Christ, one for his church, then, the, then for Israel, and, and to destroy Antichrist. Show me that in the Bible. Give me chapter and verse where it says there are two comings yet. Well, I have a simple response. Show me chapter and verse in the Old Testament where it said there were two comings. Can you give me a verse? Never. There is no such verse. But we do believe in two comings, don't we? Whether we're pre, mid, post, ah, whatever we are, we believe that Jesus came once. We believe he's coming again, right? He said, I will come again. How could you know that from the Old Testament? That was what confused the disciples. Confused John the Baptist. He sent two of his disciples from prison to, to talk when he was in prison to ask Jesus, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? Why was he confused? Because he's in prison about to get his head cut off, and it doesn't compute. I mean, after all, Lord, I introduce you to Israel, I ought to be at least prime minister. How come I'm here, you know, about to be killed? And, and, and I mean, if you're the Messiah, and you're going to take the throne of your father David, you're going to have to displace King Herod. But he's got all the troops. You've got nothing but a ragtag band of ex-prostitutes and ex-fishermen. How are you going to pull this off? No, he's not going to pull it off. He didn't come to take the throne of David. He came as the lamb, not as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He came as a lamb to die for our sins. And if you read the Old Testament carefully, you would see there are contradictions that you cannot reconcile unless there are two comings. So right in Isaiah 53, in one chapter, it says, He will see his seed. He will prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord will prosper. No, it says, He's cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people uh, is he stricken. How about... Uh, Daniel 9 says the Messiah comes and he's cut off. No, but Isaiah 9 says of his kingdom and peace, there is no end. Now, how can you get killed and, and rule forever on the throne of David? You can't possibly do it. So you couldn't put into one event in one time frame what the Old Testament said about the coming of Christ. You had to know there were two events. And it's the same in the New Testament. You can't put in one event and one time frame what the New Testament says about the return of Christ. He's coming at a time of peace, as it was in the days of Noah. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. As it was in the days of Lot and so forth. So will be in the coming of the Son of Man. No, he's coming at a time of war. He's coming in the middle of Armageddon. He's coming when any idiot knows he's coming. We just read it. No, he's coming when nobody would expect him. You better watch and be ready. Uh, you couldn't put what the New Testament says about the return of Christ into one event and, and one time frame. Okay, there are these two events, and I think that the Bible is very clear. Now, a key concept is imminency. I believe that Christ can come at any moment. There are no signs. There's nothing that stands between us. The Antichrist doesn't have to appear. The pre-wrath rapture, for example, of, of Van Campen, Robert Van Campen, they say that we have to face the Antichrist first. Well, if I have to face the Antichrist first, I'm not watching for Christ, am I? Why would I look for Christ until Antichrist comes? If Antichrist must come first. If I have to go through the Great Tribulation, why would I be looking for Christ? There's no point in looking for Christ until the end of the Great Tribulation. But what does the Bible say? Well, we quoted it. Um, 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10. Now you turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to what? Wait for his son from heaven. How about that? Uh, how about 
uh, Philippians 3.20, our citizenship, our manner of life is in heaven, from whence also we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his body of glory. Uh, how about Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior. How about Hebrews 9, 27, unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation and so forth. The early church was watching and waiting expectantly and looking for Christ. And if we went to, wow, we just, oh, I'm sorry, time runs out. Uh, maybe we can just quickly ho hold your finger in Matthew 24. And maybe we can quickly flip over to Luke. Uh, chapter 12, and see what Jesus says. Verse 35, let your loins be girded about, your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord will find. Verse 40, be ye therefore ready also for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. So Jesus himself is telling us, you better watch and be ready. And notice verse 45, and you have this also in Matthew 24. But, and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maid servants and so forth. A thought of delay of the rapture is always associated with evil. And the realization that Christ could come in any moment is the most powerful motive for holy living and for witnessing, because I may not have tomorrow. Uh, but if you think he's going to delay his coming, I mean, if he doesn't come until the end of the Great Tribulation, well, I've got a lot of time to get my act together. You know, I can do what I please, and you know, but, but then, then I'll kind of, you know, uh, uh, straighten up and, and live for the Lord. So the imminency of the rapture is clearly taught in Scripture. If you knew when the Lord, I mean, if the Lord was coming, you know what, at the end of the Great Tribulation, I'm not expecting him. Are you, you following me? The scripture says the early church was watching and waiting uh, and expecting him. You can't fit that in with a post-trib or, 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 or the uh, Antichrist uh, has to come first uh, and, and so forth. So let's go back then. I want to just deal with, uh, wow, I want to deal with just a, we got to start a little late, didn't we? I want to deal with a, <laughs> I want to deal with a couple of problems. Uh, here and, and then in 2 Thess Thessalonians again. Well, there are people who say, and in fact, this is the most popular view, I don't know about here, but in America, I can tell you this is the most popular view among prophecy teachers, among theologians, even at our good, some of the best schools, like Dallas Theological Seminary and so forth. They put on a, um, uh, there's a pre-trib rapture seminar uh, a group of scholars that meet together and, uh, once a year in Dallas um, and um, they always have me speak on something that nobody believes <laughs> uh, you know and one of the one of the ideas um, is that when you present a paper then they all critique it and here are all these and I, I like to tweak them a little bit and, and uh, last uh, uh, December they had me speak on the pre-trib rapture or, or just the rapture, I guess, in the Olivet Discourse, because none of them believe it's in the Olivet Discourse. They don't believe when it says one shall be taken, two sleep in the bed, one taken, the other left. Well, that's not the rapture, they're taking, taking the judgment. And as I said, I like to have a little bit of fun with them, and I said, you know, I really feel intimidated with all of these doctors here, and I'm not even a nurse, you know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I presented to them the pre-trib rapture. In fact, I said, I told them, I think you are missing one of the most powerful arguments for a pre-trib rapture by denying that it's found here. And they say that, well, let's read it. Um, then, verse 40, then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be, shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. And, and they say, they're taken to judgment. I said to them, I don't know of any judgment that is even spoken of in the Bible where people are snatched out of beds 
and snatched out of the mill and out of the field to be taken to judgment. You want to go over to chapter 25 and read of the judgment where he separates the sheep from the goats. It says all the nations are gathered together before him. Not snatching people out of beds. Tell me what judgment this is. Well, I, 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 we give a lot of arguments. We don't have time for it. But one of the most powerful arguments is, and, and I know nothing about Greek, as I said. It could be Chinese for me. But you can look it up in the concordance like I do. And I looked it up, and I found out, what do you know? There are two different words used here. Uh, you go back to verse 39. Knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Uh, ero, I think, is the, is the Greek word there for take, took them all away. But two shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. It's a different word. Paralambano in the Greek. And if you want to look it up, go to John 14. I will come and receive you unto myself. I will come and paralambano you unto myself. Now, Christ isn't going to use the same word, one shall be taken and the other left, and he's going to use the same word that he uses in John 14, I will receive you unto myself, and they're being taken to judgment. No. Um, they're going, look, he's coming at a time when, well, go to, I, I think it's, it, it, let's go over to Luke again, Luke 17, and then we'll get to, uh, back to 2 Thessalonians. And then we'll try to wind it up. Now Luke 17. See, some people don't like it because in, in Matthew 24, it says the flood came and took them all away. And so they say, you see, it's the wicked who are taken away. It's not the righteous who are taken away. Well, let's read it in, in Luke. And verse 26, Luke 17, 26. As it was in the days of Noah so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Now, what are the th one of the things that you could say, well, evil, you know, but he's not emphasizing that. He tells you exactly uh, what, he refer what he means. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded, but in the same day that Lot went out of Sodom. So here is someone being taken out, and then judgment follows. It's a wonderful picture of the rapture, but the point is, what are the conditions upon the earth at the time of the rapture? Well, peace. Nobody's expecting judgment. The last thing you ever th they ever thought of would be judgment, but you only have to get to Revelation 6 when they're crying out to the mountains and the rocks to fall upon them, to hide them from the, from the wrath of the one who sits upon the throne. Uh, you couldn't imagine these conditions at the end of the Great Tribulation. So if you believe in a post-trib rapture, that it just you couldn't fit it into this. Furthermore, a post-trib rapture would be a classic non-event. There's nobody left to rapture because Revelation 13 very clearly says that he has authority the Antichrist has power over the saints. What saints are those? If the church has been raptured, there will be many who will come to Christ after the great, during the Great Tribulation. They will pay for their faith with their lives, with their blood. And you see a great multitude under the throne in Revelation, and they cry out, Lord, how long will you revenge us? Not until the rest of your brethren are slain. Uh, so if, if there's a post-trib rapture, I mean, if you, don't, if you don't take the mark of the beast, you can't buy or sell. Uh, if you don't bow down and worship him, you're killed. So what Christians would be left for a post-trib rapture? Well, Pat Robertson says, well, he's going to you know, protect us, and, and we'll get stronger, and, and so forth. That's not, not what the Bible says. And so Christ is coming at a time when you don't expect him, and he's coming at a time of peace and prosperity and partying and, and so forth. And that kind of describes the, the church of, of our day. Well, go back then to 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, because there's a problem verse here that really bothers people. Verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, that is the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, we referred to earlier, shall not come, except there come the last day's great revival, and we'll hear of it on TBN, and, and, and the churches will be preaching it because there's this great in-gathering of... No, 
I mean, they have a phony revival, I'm sorry, and we gave you some of the statistics uh, of the hundreds of thousands of people that are supposedly coming to Christ in America, and you can't find them. They're not in church. I mean, some places they've got so many people saved, the whole city ought to be saved by now. If you add it up, all, but where are they? No, Paul says, don't let anybody sweet talk you with this last day's great revival nonsense. That day, the day of the Lord, will not come except there comes the apostasy, the falling away. And, well, we've talked about the apostasy. How much worse does it have to get? It was around, uh, Paul said, after my departing, grievous wolves will enter in, and so forth. So the, you could say the apostasy really began after the, after the apostles departed. Um, this apostasy has been going on all this time. It's getting worse. But anyway, let's go back and read it. Except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now that really trips people up. Well, you see, see it says the Antichrist must come first. No, it doesn't say the Antichrist come first, must come first. It says the apostasy must come first. Let me put it like this. Uh, next Sunday will not come except Saturday come first. And we have a big roast beef dinner. Now, when are we going to have the big roast beef dinner? Not Saturday, but Sunday. I didn't say you had to have the roast beef dinner first. I said Saturday must come first. But I said Sunday won't come without having a roast beef dinner. So what Paul is saying is the day of the Lord will not come except the apostasy comes first and the day of the Lord will not come without the Antichrist being revealed. In fact, he's going to be revealed in the day of the Lord and I can tell you how I think he will be revealed. And I believe a pre-trib rapture is the key to the whole thing. If 100, 100 million, I don't know how many, we've got 1.8 billion professing Christians in this, in this world, uh, just in round figures, 1 billion Roman Catholics, 400 million Orthodox, 400 million Protestants and evangelicals and so forth. Out of all of those, how many do you think are genuine? I don't know. Let's be generous. Let's say 100 million. If 100 million people suddenly vanished from planet Earth, what would the reaction be? You can't, and I can't even imagine the reaction. I forget the chaos, you know, if it happened at, you know, in, in the middle of the freeway in, in Los Angeles, I mean, in, in the middle of the, uh, you know, going to work or going home hour. Uh, I mean, our freeways, wow, and there, there's a, even a fraction as many Christians as we say there are, and they phew, left, and their cars are careening everywhere. Uh, airplanes, I mean, sometimes when I get on an airplane, the cockpit crew recognizes me, they're Christians, uh, and planes are falling out of the sky, and all, all kinds of things happening. But forget the chaos. What would be the condition on this earth? Terror! Absolute, stark, raving terror. Can you imagine? Where did they go? They've seen them vanish right off of escalators in front of them, right out of elevators, right out of the desk, sitting at the desk next to them on the job in mid-sentence. They're gone. The United Nations, they haven't lost anybody. They're... <laughs> they're... <laughs> The, the, the United Nations is meeting an emergency session. The computers are worrying. I don't think NATO's lost too many either. They're, the computers are going and they're trying to figure out what happened. Where did they go? Who took them? And all of this science fiction stuff has only prepared us to believe. Beam me up, Scotty. The, uh, I mean, I have talked to UFO cults, cult members, who say that the Space Brothers who run the UFOs have told them that when they take over and they establish this new world order, all those who are rebels in their heart and are not willing to go along with this are going to be instantly removed to a slave. They're going to be taken off to a slave planet where their minds will be reprogrammed before they're allowed back on planet Earth. I've talked to, uh, you know, New Agers. New Agers believe that when the moment of transformation comes, when there will be a transformation to a higher species, homo noeticus, they call it. All those who haven't been doing their yoga, they're not spiritually prepared. They will be instantly removed to a non-physical dimension where their karma will have to catch up with them before they're allowed back on planet Earth. I don't know, there are all kinds of theories, but I can tell you this world will be terrorized. And I believe nothing else would unite this world. You're gonna unite, unite 
one billion Muslims who will take your head off if they could. You're going to unite them with, with you know, Presbyterians and Methodists. I, a lot of churches are going to have more people in them the Sunday after the rapture than the, <laughs> than the Sunday before. You're going to unite capitalists and communists uh, and enemies. And, and, and it's very clear in the scripture, there will be a one world government and they will worship the leader. That's what it says. The whole world will worship him. And a one world religion. This world is going to be united and I don't see anything else that could unite it except the terror of this rapture. I mean, if uh, you could have a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Hindu, and I'm an atheist and so forth, and maybe they're all enemies and, and their plane crashes in the Himalayas, they're the only survivors. I tell you, they're united <laughs> in a common purpose of saving one another's lives. And I don't think anything else would unite this world. And I believe at that moment, or very shortly, uh, not days, hours, maybe even minutes, I don't know, but very quickly a man arises and he has all the power of Satan. He can do signs and wonders, lying signs and wonders. And I could give you a lot of scenarios, but here's one of them, very likely in, in, in view of what we, you know, what I say we editorially believe, what our scientists, they believe they're out there. We, we sent messages out there on Voyager and Pioneer, our space probes that we've sent out in space, uh, you know, Jimmy Carter, president, signed one of them. Uh, we're a friendly bunch here on Earth, he said, and we don't mean any trouble. And any of you guys out there find this, we want you to know that, and we hope one day, having solved our problems, to join an intergalactic community. This is Jimmy Carter, professing Christians, but he's not, uh, not a Christian. Uh, in my opinion, he says Mormons are Christians, and he took the Southern Baptist Convention to task for trying to convert Mormons, uh, who, well, we can't go into what, what they believe, but Jimmy Carter's last words on that message were, this is our hope in a vast and awesome universe. That's why I titled one of my books, Whatever Happened to Heaven? I thought heaven was our hope. No, he says, our dream is to join an intergalactic community. So if the Antichrist probably at that moment he arises, he has all these powers, he says, let me tell you something, I know where they went. It was a rogue civilization that took them. I'm negotiating with an intergalactic council and I'm gonna get them back. But in the meantime, you take my mark on your hand or forehead and that will be your only hope. That's the pledge that you will not be taken. Otherwise you could be snatched too. People are lining up to get his mark. I don't know uh, how, how it's gonna be but it's, I believe it's going to be something uh, similar to that. But anyway, the Bible presents the pre-trib rapture. You know what prevents him, verse 6, that he might be revealed in his time for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now hinders will hinder until he be taken out of the way. Who could that be? No one could prevent Satan from putting Antichrist on his throne as ruler of the world, except God. It's a person, he, he who now hinders, will hinder until. So this one has been hindering for 1900 years. It couldn't be anyone but God, but you can't take God out of the way. So what is he talking? How could we reconcile this? Jesus, in John 7, it says, on that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And John makes the commentary. He says, This spake he of the Spirit which they that believed on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So on the day of Pentecost, a new presence of God came upon, came into this world. Yes, the Holy Spirit was here. Um, and you can't remove the Holy Spirit because he's God and he's omnipresent. But the Holy Spirit, yes, he, he came upon or even indwelt, some of the Old Testament saints, but David prayed, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Don't pray, don't sing that. That's not a biblical song for Christians. Uh, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. You had a new indwelling, a permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit, never to leave us or forsake us. And that presence of God on this earth is what prevents the Antichrist from being revealed. For a number of reasons, we would oppose him and ex expose him. But furthermore, he has power over the saints to kill him. But, but the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. So the church is removed. 
It's the tribulation saints that, that, that he kills. And until we are removed, the Antichrist cannot be uh, revealed. And that is the presence of the Holy Spirit, the new presence that there never was on the earth uh, before the day of Pentecost will be removed from this earth when the church is removed. Okay, finally, how do you get to heaven? We were talking about the rapture. Jesus talked more about heaven, but he also talked a lot about hell. Jesus talked more about hell than anybody. Jesus warned about hell. Jesus warned about separation from him, from his Father, forever. How do we qualify to get to heaven? Well, by the way, I didn't show you this. I had it right here. I got this last time I was in, in South Africa. 5,000 rand reward offered to anyone that, with biblical proof that a rapture will occur before the Great Tribulation. I think we've given you the evidence tonight uh, from, from the scriptures, but I wouldn't try to present it to someone like that. They're not going to believe it anyway, no matter how, how clear it is. But how do we get to heaven? This is really solemn. I don't know all of you. Uh, we all have friends and relatives, surely, who don't know the Lord. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. John Marks Templeton does not believe that. And for Bill Bright, Charles Colson, uh, 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 Bill, uh, and Billy Graham to encourage him and to accept this prize and so forth only confuses people. It is contrary to the word of God. Jesus is very dogmatic. No man comes to the Father but by me. Peter was very dogmatic. Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other. We had someone from Baha'i here uh, a couple of nights ago, and he left me a little book of the prophecy, you know, ba the Bab, who was claimed to be the gate, and then Baha'u'llah, and we're going to honor all religions and bring all religions together, uh, and so forth. And they talk about the coming Redeemer. and the Look, there's only redemption in his blood, the forgiveness of sins. It is only because God himself became a man, never ceased to be God, will never cease to be man. He's the one and only God-man. And because of who he is, he could pay the penalty that his own infinite justice required. And without that, there is no hope. It's a matter of justice. It's that simple. Look, in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus wept. He sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. This is what the scripture says. Why? Was he afraid to die? No. Was he a, a, a afraid of the pain of being crucified? No. Why, I don't know how many, maybe thousands, hundreds at least, many men who were crucified gritted their teeth. They would not give those Roman soldiers the satisfaction of a whimper. Do you think Jesus could bear the pain? as many others had. By the way, I hope you understand, it's not the crucifixion of Christ that saves you. That's what we did to him. That's not going to save anybody. That would only add to our condemnation. It's because as he hung on that cross, it pleased Yahweh to bruise him. Thou hast put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. It was because when he hung on that cross, he took the penalty that his own infinite justice required. And when he said, it is finished, tetelotestai, a Greek term, it's an accounting term that means the debt is paid in full. It's only because of that that there is the salvation is available for us, forgiveness from God. Now, Jesus prayed in the garden, remember? Father, if it be possible... Let this cup pass from me. Don't make me go through this. If there's any, if, whoops, if there's any other way that mankind can be saved, don't make me go through this. Didn't he pray that? What was the answer from his father? No other way. Now look, uh, you know, you, you dare not even mention Mother Teresa. I mean, she's about that far below God. Uh, she's lived such a wonderful life. Uh, and we don't fault her 
uh, for picking people up out of the gutter and putting them in a, in a clean bed and so forth. But you know what Mother Teresa said? She said, she said this at a prayer breakfast in Washington, D.C. She said that her hope of heaven was because she traveled so much and she suffered so much through publicity and traveling and so forth. She said, I hope that that purifies me and makes me ready for heaven. She said to people that were in these beds, uh, whatever God is in your mind, you must accept. She said, if you're a Buddhist, I'll help you become a better Buddhist. If you're a Muslim, I'll help you become a better Muslim. If you're a Hindu, I'll help you become a better Hindu. She did not know the gospel. She prayed the rosary constantly uh, for her salvation, prayed to Mary for her salvation, and so forth. Now look, the Bible says, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. I am convinced, unless in her dying moments, uh, from everything that Mother Teresa said, that she did not believe the gospel. She didn't know the gospel. But wait a minute. Look at the life she lived. The, you know, the, the self-denial and helping these people. I mean, you can't keep her out of heaven. Really? Look, Jesus wept in the garden. He said, if there's any other way, don't make me go through this. And now God lets people into heaven some other way without believing in him, without faith in Christ alone and believing in his finished work upon the cross. Nevertheless, through their good works, God slips them in the back door. That is a slap in the face to Jesus Christ. Then why did you make him go through this? He pleaded, is there any other way? And the Father said, there's no other way. Furthermore, it undermines our confidence in God. I, as I travel around sometimes, I see, a, well, I've seen some little two-year-olds. Uh, by the way, we didn't see it where we were staying now, praise God. But I've seen some little, well, there weren't any two-year-olds. There was a five-month and, and a four-year-old. But I've seen little two-year-olds that ought to have an emperor's crown on their head. They run the show. And everybody's afraid to cross them. They'll throw a tantrum. They're in charge. And we raise our children to believe that they are more important than anyone else. I've seen a little, little girl, a little boy does something, and mommy says, you do that again, and you're going to get it. She just does it again. And nothing happens. So we teach our kids we don't mean what we say. But God means what he says. And if he told Christ that there's no other way, and then he lets somebody in another way, that undermines the integrity of God himself. He cannot do it. Furthermore, why? When Christ has made his salvation available to all. And it is a free gift. You don't have to merit. You don't have to work it. There's nothing you can do to earn it. But you receive it as a free gift. Why not take it? I want to just close with a, with a true story. And we've said some things not so complimentary about Billy Graham. Uh, this is uh, something on the other side of Billy Graham. Now, this was early in his life, way back, uh, many years ago, in fact. It's a true story. Uh, Billy, and it's one of the most beautiful stories that I know, and I hope you will remember it, and I hope you will use it to help people understand the gospel. He was driving his own car all alone, and he happened to be going through a very small town in the southeastern part of the United States, Louisiana or Georgia or somewhere down there. And suddenly, a red light siren behind him. He gets pulled over by a motorcycle officer who gives him a ticket for speeding. Now, in those little towns in the southeast part of the United States, they don't let you go back to New York and hope you'll mail them a check. You go right to the judge. They take you right to the judge, and you don't get out of town until you pay the fine. So the motorcycle officer, this true story, remember, motorcycle officer escorted Billy Graham uh, to the judge, well, justice of the peace, they call him, in a very small town. And the justice of the peace, and this, he happened to be a barber most of the time. And so he was barbering a customer when Billy Graham uh, came in and sat down. So Billy Graham had to wait. Till, and when he was done with the customer, he took off his barber's apron. He opened a drawer, 
actually happened, folks. It's a true story. He pulled out a long black robe and he put it on. He pulled out a gavel and he pounded with a gavel. He said, the court will now come to order. What is the charge? Motorcycle officer said, Your Honor, this man was speeding. He was doing 35 in a 25 mile zone. Pounds with his gavel again. How does the defendant plead? Billy Graham said, Your Honor, truthfully, I wasn't looking at the speedometer. If he says I was speeding, we have to take his word for it. Pounds with the gavel again. I find the defendant guilty as charged. Now, you know it's a long time ago by the fine. He said, That will be $10, $1 for every mile. Well, that would be several hundred dollars now. But anyway, so Billy Graham reaches into his pocket and pulls out his wallet and starts to fumble for the money. But the Justice of the Peace, Barber, is looking at him curiously and he says, I've seen you some, you look familiar. I've seen you on television. You're Billy Graham. What an honor to have you here. You know, and, and Billy Graham reaches out, shakes his hand. Such a friendly, con really happened, folks, such a friendly conversation falls. Billy Graham put his wallet away. And the conversation seems to come to an end, a friendly end. And Billy Graham turns to leave. He pounds with his gavel. He says, that will be $10, $1 for every mile. He said, I may just be a barber most of the time, but when I sit on this bench, I try to run an honest court. The ticket has been written out. It has to be paid. And Billy Graham reached for his wallet again, but before he could get it out, the barber, just the piece, he reached into the barber's drawer, took $10 out, put it in the court's drawer, and wrote out a receipt for Billy Graham. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. Amen. Now, Billy Graham could have said ah, to the motorcycle officer as he was driving there, hey, I'm not worried, I know the judge's mother. Um, well, there are a lot of Catholics that think that Mary will let them in. No, that's, that's corruption, folks, isn't it? Isn't that corruption? This man's running an honest court. You couldn't pull it off. Or Billy Graham might have said to the judge, now wait a minute, I promise you, Scout Sonner, you let me off this time, I promise I'll never, ever, ever, ever break the law again. You know what the judge would say? If you never break the law again, <clears throat> you are only doing what the law requires. You don't get extra credit for that. You cannot make up for having broken the law in the past by keeping the law in the future because the law requires that you perform perfectly. What are we going to do? The ticket's written out on all of us and has to be paid. And Billy could have paid it, but you and I can't pay it because God's justice is infinite and we would be separated from God forever and forever and forever. But the judge himself, God himself, became a man and paid the penalty that his own infinite justice required. And if you've never understood that until tonight, maybe you've had some sentimental attachment to Jesus as a wonderful person who died for his ideals or whatever, or you're so sympathetic for what he suffered on the cross because of the nails driven in hands and feet, that's not going to save you. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. He was buried. He rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And he's alive, and he wants to come into each person's heart. Let's bow in prayer, and I'm not going to ask you to stand up, raise your hand, come forward, anything. But I would like to pray a prayer, such as I prayed, I think it'll be 50, 60 years, coming up uh, the end of this month, when I opened my heart to Christ, and the man that led me to Christ may just share this that might be helpful to some of you. I believed the gospel. I knew that Christ had died for my sins, but the thing that always bugged me was, I was a, a teenager now, the thing that bothered me was, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And I thought, supposing I, I say I believe, I mean I think I believe, uh, but suppose there's a secret doubt somewhere in, in my heart that I'm not even aware of. That really bothered me, and it kept me from coming to Christ. And the man that led me to Christ, he turned me to Revelation 3.20, a verse that I knew, where Jesus said after his resurrection, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's the door of every human heart. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And he said to me, Look, you're, you're, you're trying to get enough faith. You're trusting in your faith to save you. Why don't you just ask Jesus, open your heart, and ask Jesus to come in. That was like a revelation to me. And I got on my knees, and I prayed something like this. And if you are not sure of your salvation, you've never 
You, you haven't met Christ. You've never really received him as your Savior. Uh, you could pray something like this, just in your heart to him. You could say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are God who became a man. You never cease to be God. You'll never cease to be man. You are the one and only God-man. You, because of who you are, you were a and your love for me, you were able to pay the penalty for my sins. No man could take your life from you. They couldn't uh, take your life by crucifying you. You said, I lay it down to myself. And you committed yourself, your spirit, into your Father's hands. You said it is finished. You paid the penalty your own infinite justice required. You went into the grave for three days and three nights. And you are alive now. Lord Jesus, you said, if I would open the door, you would come into my heart. And right now, best I know how, Lord, just by an act of my will, I don't understand everything, but I hear you knocking at the door. And I open my heart's door. Come in, Lord Jesus. I receive you to my heart and to my life as my Savior. Thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for paying the penalty that I deserve. Lord, I pray for any who prayed that prayer. They may have felt you come in. They may have felt nothing. We don't go by feelings. We go by your promise. You said if they would open the door, you would never leave them. You would come in and you would never leave them nor forsake them. And Father, I pray for the rest of us. We've, uh, we haven't all been at every meeting, but we've talked about so much, about the uh, authority of your words, the necessity for authority, the sufficiency, the inerrancy of your scriptures, that we, based ever, we base everything upon your word. I pray that you will help us to know your word. Uh, help us to be your witness, to, witnesses, to stand true to you, to earnestly contend for the faith, once for all delivered to the saints, and help us to rescue many from the delusions all about us before it is too late. Bless this fellowship of believers, Lord, Mightily use them to your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.